Well, good morning, everyone. Today I thought I would try something a little different. Everybody is all locked in in the quarantine and probably getting pretty bored by now. So I thought I'd change the scenery a little bit. Today we're going to be talking about uh, eternal life and uh, one of the favorite words of all realtors, location, location, location. So we're going to be going right up here to area of Italy and talking a little bit about that today. But first, I thought I would give you a little tour of my quarantine uh, facilities. So we'll take a little walk here out toward the back. I'll get a chance to introduce you to the family. So this is the Holt and Sims clan here on the wall. Uh, you can see my the orphanage and my Guatemala daughters down here. Big family. Right there, all my brothers and sisters. Two preacher's wives, three preachers, one missionary. The oldest preacher in the family is uh, in his early 80s and still preaching in two Cumberland Presbyterian churches. Lots of memories on this wall. And you can see over here, this is at 50 years, and this is day number one. And then here is how I feel about all of you. The faith we share makes the friendship we share very special. So we're going to try our Bible study outside this morning. It's a Beautiful day here in Mount Juliet. I'm not sure how the sun is going to affect my video, but we will find out after I get it all set up here. I have to take my time getting the camera all set up. All right, for our music this morning I want you to turn to Psalm 5 1 through 3 Psalm 5 1 through 3 and uh, you probably know this little chorus from church days so sing along with me Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. My King and my God. thou hear in the morning, O oh Lord, in the morning, will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up, O oh Lord. Let's 
pray. Father, it's a beautiful morning. You care so much for us. You love us. You provide for us. So thank you for the birds singing and for the beautiful outdoors. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for love. Thank you for Jesus. I thank you for all my friends, Christian friends, those who are watching today and those who are unable to. God bless us all that we might be quality representatives of Jesus Christ to those who so desperately need him. In his name I pray. Amen. All right, well, let me put this away and we'll get started. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> well, I hope you're able to see the, the PowerPoint today. I tried to block the sun as, as much as I could. But we are, uh, this is the very last session of our uh, unpacking the language, the holy language, and uh, the language of faith. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about eternal life. And so, you know, there's all kinds of thoughts about eternal. Uh, I remember in math, uh, as a young guy in math in, in school, um, the concept of uh, infinity. You might remember that, the little eight laying on its side, and the concept of infinity. And um, I, I couldn't figure out what that really meant. Uh, nothing lasts forever, right? And so uh, I was just a young guy in school. And then later, uh, when I was in church, and the pastor was talking about eternity, then I began to, to connect the two. So mathematics even has a symbol that represents eternity. And so I decided to look up some definitions of uh, eternity and uh, the word eternal. Um, and so I found out that it was uh, words such as uh, lasting, uh, existing forever, without end, um, or a, without end or a beginning. Uh, also, well, you've got to turn that on. <laughs> uh, valid for all time, essentially unchanging. All those have to do with the understanding of and the definition of eternity. But we as human beings who, you know, we got our watches on and we're always checking our watch or uh, we're checking the cable TV. It's got the little time up in the corner. Uh, everything seems to be on schedule. Time means a lot to us. Um, and it was nine o'clock central time this morning, and you knew that you had to get the, you know, the TV turned on and uh, to be able to watch uh, the, on Facebook to watch this this video. And so we're kind of locked in to time and, and monitoring time. So we as human beings find it difficult to wrap our arms around this concept of infinity mathematics or in this particular case eternity and so in the context of challenged to understand eternity we're going to talk about eternal life we read about that all the time in the scripture and if you're born again if you're a Christian you understood that concept that if you confess your sin and you repent and you accept Jesus Christ as Savior into your life that you have quote eternal life so uh, I looked up on Google, of course. Google knows everything, right? And so uh, Google had uh, 286 million mentions of eternal or eternity uh, on the Internet. And, I, of course, I didn't look, <laughs> look at all those. Uh, but uh, you can imagine the different definitions that other people would have of uh, eternity, eternal things. So... When you look at the eternity as being everlasting, you look at it as never ending, which is a very difficult concept for us. Uh, you look at it as endless, as perpetual, as constant, continual, persistent. All of that folds into this thing we try to define as eternal life. You know, many of us, most of us watching are, are probably in our senior years we get senior discounts 
everywhere. So we're in our senior years. And, and we have those things, you know, it's, it's difficult to do what you used to do, and you have these uh, little maladies that come up, uh, slow moving, muscle aches, all those kinds of things that we're challenged with. Um, and medications, we've all, <laughs> we all got these containers of medications, you know, in our bathroom cabinets or wherever. Um, and, and we know well the signs and the challenges of aging. Uh, I, yesterday I spoke to a man I haven't heard from in many, many, many years. Uh, he used to be the church cook at Hilldale Baptist Church in Clarksville, Tennessee. And his name is James Williams. And I was so surprised to hear from him. And we talked for over an hour just about the old days and, and he kept talking about how time was moving on and he's now 96 years old. Uh, he and his wife Mary are, are doing well there in Clarksville. And uh, so it just kind of, you know, memories came back to me from uh, 20 years ago of spending time with him uh, as we minister to people, him from the kitchen and me from the ministry uh, area of the church. And so uh, it was just a reminder to me of, of not only, quote, the good old days, but it was a reminder of me as I heard his weak voice that time marches on. Time is no respecter of persons. And so uh, the, as we get older and we get toward the end of our life, we begin to think about perhaps what eternal life is all about. So we're going to be over in uh, uh, Revelation today. Uh, of course, John, the Apostle John wrote uh, Revelation uh, around A.D. Uh, 95 when he was in prison or he was at least uh, uh he was uh, sent to the Isle of Patmos to live out the rest of his life. Um, although I'm not sure he uh, stayed there until he actually died, but the Isle of Patmos. And so in order to, to put this in perspective in the world, the Isle of Patmos is in the Adriatic Sea. And I don't know if you can see the map or not in this light out here, but, but if you go uh, between Italy and Croatia, that span of water that comes up along the northeast coast of Italy uh, is the Adriatic Sea. And if you go from, from Italy right across the Adriatic Sea, you're going to be in modern-day Croatia. So that is where the Isle of Patmos was. It was out in the middle of that body of water. And that's where uh, he, John was exiled there. It's just basically a, a big rock in the middle of the Adriatic Sea out there. There's not much there. And so it's not like he could uh, do much exciting uh, work or exciting things there. Um, so as we think about uh, heaven, as we think about eternal life, uh, you know, the favorite realtor word comes up, location, location, location. It's all about location. Uh, over in Isaiah, if you look in the last chapter of, of Isaiah, he, uh, he tells about uh, a new heaven, he, he prophesies about a new heaven and a new earth uh, that are going to be coming down. Then you look in Revelation, and then you find in these last two chapters, you find the um, fulfillment of that prophecy. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and, and take a look at our scripture for today. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 21, and our first segment is going to be verses uh, 1 through 8. So let me go ahead and, and read that. <clears throat> and this is John writing. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there were no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, 
for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is uh, an amazing passage of scripture. This is God speaking directly to the Apostle John. The Apostle John indicates in Revelation that he was actually caught up into heaven. He was, uh, whether he was physically there or whether spiritually God pulled his spirit into heaven, I, I think maybe that's up for debate. But John was speaking directly to God and God was speaking directly to the Apostle John, telling him to write these things. Well, for us, here 2,000 years later or so. So, in this passage of Scripture, if we look at um, the key words, of course, there's lots of key words in here, but the things that jump out is the words new and no more. We like new things. I mean, <laughs> How many of us have gone out and bought new cars or maybe new furniture? Uh, we, we just had a, a gentleman move in our community here, just bought a house uh, right next door to me. And I went over and, and kept my six foot distance and, and said hello and welcomed him to the community. And he, the moving truck was unloading and he said, uh, I've got to get all this stuff in the house and then I've got to go buy new furniture. So, you know, a new beginning with a new house for him. And so new furniture seemed to make sense. So we like new things. Uh, you know, there are old things that we wear out over time and something that we thought was very, very important to us maybe years ago that we might even have spent a lot of money on. Uh, we find that it gets scrapes on it, it gets dirty, or it, it gets rusty, or whatever the case may be. And so someday, something that I paid $500 for, I'll sell at a garage sale for five bucks. Something like that, you know. Or maybe end up giving it away, who knows. So we like new things. And so here, God is, is telling John, Something brand new is going to happen at the end here. Something that will be uh, amazing and just astounding. And, and so John, is he's recording here what he visualized, what he saw. Uh, certainly, while he was on the Isle of Patmos, the new heaven and earth didn't come down. So he was up in heaven, whether it was spiritually or, or physically, and God was revealing to him what was going to happen. And he said, I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and earth had passed away and there was no more sea and by the way that reference to the sea is if you look back in uh i believe it's chapter 13 of revelation you see where the evil one comes out of the sea to impact uh, people and to destroy and so this is a reference to uh, no more beginnings of evil no no more uh being challenged uh, by the evil one uh, coming into your life uh, but here's what's interesting about this, and as I've said many times, uh, Bible reading is different than Bible study. So when you do Bible study and you look at this particular passage, and he, and he says, um, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down. This word new does not refer to the, uh, necessarily refer to the old earth being blown up or, or the heavens being uh, scrapped and thrown away 
this this means a a quality a new quality in the heavens and the earth a, a new uh, excellence uh, a new perfection perhaps so so the word new here uh, can easily be translated as refurbished or improved or made perfect those kinds of things um, and of course, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar, so I, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know the, the details of all those. But, but as, I, as I study this and as I look at this, the meaning of that word does not say destroy the old, throw the old away, and just make something totally brand new. It means making it quality, making what, what is here perfect, and so on. And so we find that, that he says it's going to be brand new and people like new things. Uh, the, the new heaven, the new earth, um, and he is referring to just spiritual excellence. Can you imagine the perfection of being present with God? I mean, that in itself is enough. But he says on top of that, everything we see will be new to us, a, a new atmosphere in which we live, uh, perhaps a new understanding of other uh, people that we see, other others in heaven that we see, maybe a, a finally a perfect, a new quality understanding of of who God was all along. Because I don't think we really have the concept, the depth of who God is and, and who He wants to be in our lives. Um, and then John says here that he actually hears God speaking, and in the word tabernacle. You remember when they were wandering in the desert. Uh, God instructed them to build a tabernacle. A tabernacle was a big tent uh, with the Holy of Holies inside that where God actually physically dwelt with the people in that Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And so he, what he's doing is he's talking about here the very presence of God with us. So we have something brand new. We have a, a new heaven. We have a new earth. This, what I'm looking at here, this is a beautiful place. Uh, there are trees all around, and you can probably hear may, maybe hear some of the birds. Uh, there's a few rabbits that hop around every once in a while. I'm not sure they're on camera, but but this is a beautiful place, and and um, I, I love it here in the morning when it just looks so pristine and clean and, and beautiful. Uh, but this is going to be way above what you're seeing here. This is going to be absolutely in, incredible. He says, I'm going to be with you. The tabernacle of God is with you, and I will dwell with you. I'll dwell with men, he says. Um, he said, uh, they will be my people, and I will be their God. And, and I thought at first, now wait a minute. We've always been God's people, and he has always been our God. That's the way it was from the beginning. But once again, this is a reference to renewal. This is a reference to perfection to an, an understanding of who God really is and who we really are as his children. That's quite an amazing concept to me. He says, I will be with them and I will be their God. They will be my people. And then talk about the challenges of this world. Right now we're facing this coronavirus and many people are dying. And many people have already died from just the flu that goes around every year and there are other things that happen in the world there are accidents and there are heart attacks and diseases and and all kinds of reasons why human beings die uh, and so we've always been imperfect we've always had these maladies but he said uh, I'm gonna wipe away every tear uh, he said there'll be no more death can you imagine people who fear death and he says here, no more death, no sorrow, no crying. Once again, it's a picture of renewal. It's a picture of uh, perfection that he's talking about here that John is writing about. So it's, talking, it's about a new perfected earth, a quality, a spiritual quality of earth that has never existed before. He's talking about uh, the very presence of God with us. Uh, us, it said we're going to be his people. Well, we've always been his people, right? But now he's talking about we will really be his people. We will really have an understanding of who he is. We will really 
see the need to honor him and worship him and bow before him and submit to the perfection that he created for us. That's what it means when he says we shall be his people. He says he's going to take away all those things that we dread. Uh, we, you know, I have a problem with my knee, and so I won't. <laughs> then uh, people have hip replacements and knee replacements and, and heart transplants and all kinds of stuff like that. But at this particular time here, none of that will be needed. He says all that stuff is going to go away. Uh, and then he says uh, in, in verse 6, he says to John, I want you to write this down. It is done. Whatever God means about it is done. This creation that he made, it has run its course. It is done. It is finished. And now we spend eternity with God. You know, some people have asked me, once that happens, once God comes and he it goes through the whole process of, of this earth we're talking about here, and finally we end up eternity with him in heaven. What then? And Well, I usually say we'll be with God forever. And so one guy asked me, well, no, what I mean is, is God going to do this again? Is he going to create another universe? Is he going to have another planet somewhere that he's going to, create uh, a, a species, whether it's human beings or something else, is God going to do that? Well, I have no clue. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I couldn't care less. All I know is that God is my Father. This is a picture of who He is and what He cares about and what He has promised and what He is going to do. And so I just praise God that I am part of that. I, I want this. This is a picture of what I want. And I trust that, that most of you want that also. I, I pray that everybody watching and listening is uh, born again and, and sees the, what, the, what an incredible gift from God this is. He says uh, down in verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And uh, some believe that he's talking about Jesus here uh, and that we are uh, uh, disciples of Jesus and we are reflections of Jesus. At least we should be reflections of Jesus. Um, but he says here that you'll be my son. And then in verse 8, he gives a caveat here. He says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I tell you what, if, if you read that verse just by itself, it's kind of a scary thing. Because uh, as I read that verse, many, many of you were running through your mind how you have violated these. There are many of these words here that you have violated either either physically or in your mind and remember the scripture says that if you break one commandment you've broken them all so um, this is kind of a scary thing but when you put this in context with all of the scripture in context with what John understood of a, a as a relationship with God you know that he is saying those who are who have these kinds of lifestyles but have never confessed and repented and accepted Christ as Savior. He's listing the people who are unsaved here. There are more categories we could list. There are other sins that we could, wrongdoings and sins that we could write down. Um, but this is a picture of all of us before we accepted Christ. And it's a picture of everyone who doesn't know Christ as personal Savior. So this is an incredible passage here. Uh, it, it is an incredible good news to us from God. So let's take a look at our second uh, portion of Scripture here. In uh, Revelation 22, 
uh, verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I love this picture of a river. If you look in history, um, let's just say uh, American history as an example, and you look at how this country was settled all across the country, you find that major forts and settlements and groups of people pretty much always congregated around rivers. Well, water is the life liquid. We would not survive long without water. And this is a picture of providing eternal, fresh, clean water. I remember uh, when I was a small boy, we would uh, sometimes go across the river, take the ferry across the river to Oklahoma. And my grandfather, who actually uh, started the farm that we lived on, uh, my grandfather lived over there. And uh, I remember uh, something very special about his little farmhouse there. There was a stump out front, somewhere in the front yard of his house. It was an old uh, stump. The tree had been cut down many, many years ago. And over the years, the pressure from water underneath had finally made its way up through this stump. And there was a fresh spring of water constantly flowing out of this stump and draining down the hill toward the, the creek near the back of his house. And I thought, how amazing that I would watch that water coming out of that stump at my granddad's house. And it never stopped. For some reason, I thought it might just, somebody would turn the faucet off and, and it would stop. But that spring of water coming out of that stump flowed well, it may even still be flowing today, I'm not sure, but it seemed to flow forever. And every once in a while, we'd be out playing, running around, and, and I would come back to this stump just to see if the water was still flowing. And we would drink the water out of the stump, cup our hands down and, and get water to drink. It was cold, it was clear, it was fresh, it just was delicious. So water is a picture of all those things. Uh, think of the, uh, the comfort that water brings. Think about when you're out working in the yard or the garden and you're hot and sweaty and you come back in the house and the first thing you want is a glass of water and you get a glass of water and it is just so amazing and so refreshing. And so as John interacts with God here, he is painting a picture of that refreshment, of that renewal. It's, it's like when I remember we would plant in the uh, particular different times of the year for different crops on the farm. Uh, we would go out and I was real small so I just kind of watched a lot. Uh, but we would plant these crops. And after we planted the crops, uh, maybe that night at dinner or something, Dad would talk about rain. Wonder when we're going to get rain. Because the crops need rain. Uh, sometimes we'd have a dry spell there in East Texas and uh, mom and dad would talk about um, I'm you know worried about the crops the corn's not going to come up it's not going to be tall enough it's the ears of the corn are going to be small because we're not getting enough water uh, on the corn and so water is uh, it's a picture of life it's a picture of refreshing it's a it's a picture of clarity uh, it's it's a picture of satisfaction uh, there's nothing quite like a glass of cold water. And so he uses this metaphor, this picture of this river 
uh, it says it, it's a river of it's a river of the water of life. It's flowing uh, cl clear as a crystal, uh, and it's proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. Yeah, imagine I, you know I'm trying to as I read this I'm trying to picture what this place John is seeing might have actually looked like. Uh, but he talks about uh, in the middle of the street, uh, the center of whatever he, that picture he's seeing, and, and on either sides of the river was the tree of life. He kind of talks about the tree of life being multiple trees uh, here in the next verse. But he said the, the very thing, not only is water life-giving, and it, we our, our bodies, I forget what it is, 65% water or 68 or something like that, Water is life, and it gives the picture of the stream and the river flowing and the crystal clear water. Uh, and then he gives the picture of the tree of life on either side of this uh, river. And, the, and it's, there are 12 of them, and they are yielding fruit based on every month, based on the, the different kinds of emphasis that God has uh, for those trees. The, the leaves of the trees, talking about the healing of the nations. Uh, trees, if you look behind me, you'll see trees uh, providing shade. And so trees provide covering, they provide shade, they produce oxygen. The leaves of the trees produce uh, oxygen for our atmosphere. And so they are the healing of the nations. It's, it's like, I imagine a big blanket of, let's just say oxygen, coming from the trees just covering the whole earth with the, as, as the healing hand of God. It's an amazing thing to try to picture what that might have actually looked like to John. It must have been really amazing for him. And, and then in verse 3 he says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And what is this curse? Well, from the very beginning, you remember when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the curse that they experienced was that they would eventually die, that they would have to work, that there would be pain in childbirth, there would be sweat of your back in, in earning a living in, in some way. And the, the curse was they didn't get to spend time with God. They weren't physically with him anymore. And that has been true throughout with just a few except Enoch and others, just a few exceptions of, of having to exist in this world of imperfection. But he says, that curse, if, if I'm correct about that curse being death or that curse being separation from God, we don't have to worry about that curse anymore. He said there'll be no more curse in, in verse 3. But the throne of God and the Lamb of God are in it, in this city, and his servants shall serve him, we his servants. Uh, it says that they, meaning those in, in the uh, city with him, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And you remember the, the uh, Jew, Jewish uh, tradition of the lockets hanging between their eyes. And they would put scripture. They would uh, read scripture. They would put words or scripture in those little lockets hanging on their foreheads. Just the, the presence of the word of God to remind them of who he was. To remind them of the importance of knowing the word of God and obeying the word of God. And that's his reference here. He said it'll be ever in their mind. It'll be right there in front of them. The truth of who I am and the, the incredible beauty of what this place is and what eternity is all about. All of that is going to be in the forefront of their minds. It will be a, a, a continuous concentration on, on us, on our part, of all this perfection and beauty and excellence that God has created. The reality of who he is and the reality of what eternity is all about. And then they shall see his face and his name shall be on the foreheads. Can you imagine seeing the face of God? You know, I, I try to imagine what God looks like. I know the scripture says that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truthfully and in truth. And so we know that God is spirit, and that's the essence of who we are. This physical body is just short term. The spiritual part of us is what will live forever somewhere, either heaven or hell. But now it says, we shall see his face. I don't know what the face of God looks like. 
I often wonder what that site is going to be. But it is going to be, I think, incredible. Maybe the best word would be indescribable as to what the face of God is like. Verse 5, there shall be more, no more night there. They need no lamp or light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Human beings don't do well in darkness. Sure, we have street lights and we have lights in our house. Um, and when I was in the military, they developed night vision uh, scopes, uh, night vision binoculars. Um, and now night vision is just part of the military. Even, even uh, pilots and helicopters have night vision goggles that fold down so they can fly with no lights at all. They don't even have to have starlight or moonlight to fly. It says, He will be the light. There'll be no lamp or light for the sun. The sun is not needed. God will give them light. I remember a, a military exercise, uh, a night uh, navigation exercise. And when I was in training, they sent us out on, they sent us out on uh, the darkest night you can imagine. Uh, there, were, there was cloud cover. There was no full moon. It was the darkest I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was, honestly, it was so dark. I could not see the man in front of me. So what they had us do is we would reach out to the guy in front and hold on to his uh, backpack. And then the guy behind me would hold on to mine. And the very person in front was the only one with a flashlight and only with red light, because red light is hard for the enemy to see. And we were led through the woods in one line, one hand on the person in front of you, because I could not see that person. And it was very uh, disconcerting. It was, uh, I felt like a child, uh, unable to see where I was stepping, uh, not knowing what I was going to step on. And it was, it was kind of a scary time, actually, even though you're a grown adult in a situation like that, it can be scary. And, and when you do that, you understand why children are, are often afraid of the dark. But I'll tell you what John says here, we're not going to have to be afraid of the dark because there will be no dark. The light of God will shine on us forever. And then he ends those that verse 5 with, And they shall reign forever and ever. And so now we're back to that same challenge. is How do we reign forever? The point is, we can live forever in the presence of God. And honestly, right here in this earthly life, it's very difficult to, to wrap my arms around that term forever because in our finite minds and our finite lives, forever doesn't make sense. We cannot imagine ourselves existing forever. But it says here that we will reign with God forever and ever. So I wonder... Will you live forever? Have you come to the point in your life and in your heart where you understand that sin separates you from God? Have you come to the point where you understand the scripture truth that in order to have a permanent relationship with God, we have to confess our sin to him. We have to repent, which means Turn around and go the other way. Confess your sin and repent of your sin. And ask Jesus forgiveness and ask him to come into your life and occupy your life. And begin to commit to becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, so that you might be a quality uh, representative of him uh, on this earth. If you haven't done that, you do not have a permanent relationship with God. And this scripture, these last few verses here, will not apply to you. 
my prayer is that everybody watching and listening has made that commitment to Christ. If you haven't, you can contact me. You can email me. You can message me on Facebook. And I will be glad to share the details of how to become a Christian, how to become a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and how to be one of those that John talked about those worshiping God and being with Him forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this Word. Thank You for the Apostle John that You visualized uh, things in his mind that he could write about and that he wrote them down so that 2,000 years later we could understand who You are and have a better picture of what eternity is going to be like. I pray your blessings upon everyone, not only in my Sunday school class, but everybody during this time of quarantine, this time of the uh, concern about the virus, that we would be protected, that those who get it will recover, that you just bless the families of those who succumb to the virus. Uh, God, we love you. We just need to express that in, in a deeper way with you. So, Father, help us. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Well, I'm glad you were here today. I hope you enjoyed the outdoor Bible study today. I hope you have a great week coming up. This is Holy Week. Uh, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And this is going to be the strangest Easter ever, at least that I can remember. So we just have to do what we have to do. Please be careful. Please stay safe and stay healthy. And I hope that uh, we'll be together again next week for our Easter Bible study. God bless.